Tonight at 10, one of the best known voices on British radio, Steve Wright, has suddenly died at the age of 69. Now today, have we got a lot of stuff for you. For more than 40 years, he broadcast on BBC Radio 1 and Radio 2. His death has left his audience, friends and colleagues in shock. It made me happy, and I'm sure he made millions of people happy uh, on Radio 2. Also tonight, more problems for Sakia Starmer as Labour suspends another of its parliamentary candidates. The extraordinary work of the medics in Gaza, one paramedic tells us his story. How villagers in Warwickshire are fighting back against fly tippers. And five years since the devastating fire at Notre Dame in Paris, the scaffolding is finally coming down. On BBC London, we hear from the family of a man murdered for his watch, targeted by a gang of robbers as he celebrated his birthday. Good evening. One of the best known and most loved voices on British radio, Steve Wright, has died suddenly at the age of 69. He broadcast on BBC Radio 1 and Radio 2 for more than four decades. Famous for his daily show, Steve Wright in the Afternoon, which was listened to by millions. Messages have been pouring into the BBC since the news broke this afternoon from listeners and colleagues in tribute to the man they call one of the all-time greats. David Silito looks back at his life. Steve Wright. Steve Wright in the afternoon. All right, now just after two o'clock. Now today, have we got a lot of stuff for you? Steve Wright in the afternoon, a program that spanned more than forty years of radio history. Standby studios, action. It was only just over a year ago that it came to an end, but this afternoon, Radio Two was the bearer of some sad news. It's really hard to know what to say about the news of Steve Wright's passing, except we are all absolutely devastated. It is a shock. It was only days ago listeners heard this sign-off from his Sunday love songs. And I'm back for more love songs next Sunday. Oh, is he really? Are you a woman? Oh, great. And for those who've worked with him over his years at Radios 1 and 2, he was more than just another DJ. From my personal experience, he was... Um, a very warm, genuine man who was concerned about the people he worked with, but an extraordinarily creative presenter. I mean, he was an, a real one-off. You know, there was no one else who sounded like Steve Wright. A lot of us tried to be as good as Steve Wright, but no one, no one was that good. Steve Wright, 94. That style, the posse, Mr. Angry, voiceover man, it was zany, funny, and at its peak, it had seven million listeners a day. And the bride is 107. Yes, 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 yes. I think it was just because it was something different. It was slightly subversive. There's a little bit of satire in there. And it wasn't like, there you go, that's the great sound of. Behind the fun and laughter was a radio perfectionist. This cacophony of sound that was his show was so, so full of life. I think that's why we're all finding it so hard, because we can't believe that that life has gone. Hello, good evening, and welcome to Top of the Pops. With the he did present Top of the Pops and a few TV shows, but his home and where he shone was behind the microphone. Steve Wright, professional, slick, funny, and a master of the art of radio. Steve Wright, who has died at the age of 69. A second Labour parliamentary candidate has been suspended from the party pending an investigation. The suspension of Graham Jones, a former MP and now the prospective parliamentary candidate for Hindburn in Lancashire, comes after Labour withdrew support for the party's Rochdale by-election candidate for anti-Semitic remarks. Here's our chief political correspondent, Henry Zeffman. A year ago this week, Labour out of special measures imposed by the Equalities Watchdog over its failure to tackle anti-Semitism allegations. A moment of qualified progress. I don't see today's announcement as the end of the road. I see it as a signpost that we're heading in the right direction. Or are they? This is Azar Ali, Labour's candidate in the Rochdale by-election, now disowned because of anti-Semitic comments he made at a meeting in Lancashire in October while defending a Labour MP's remarks about Israel. I know him really well, yeah, and he's 
a solid Palestinian, pro-Palestinian supporter, the media, right, and some of the people in the media from certain Jewish uh, quarters were given about what he said. Also present at that meeting was Graham Jones, the candidate and former MP for Hindburn, although probably not the candidate for much longer. He was suspended today over anti-Israel comments he's alleged to have made at the meeting. At the heart of this story is a question. Does the fact that Labour suspended Mr Ali and Mr Jones show that the party has changed? Or does the fact that they made the comments in the first place show that it hasn't? I think Stan has been taking the public for fools. Uh, he's uh, supported and promoted a candidate who has expressed the most atrocious racism against Jewish people. And Starmer hasn't acted out of some sort of principle. He's acted out of really political expediency now. Sir Keir Starmer, on the other hand, adamant he'd made a bold but necessary call. It is a huge thing to withdraw support for a Labour candidate during the course of a by-election. It's a tough decision, a necessary decision. But when I say the Labour Party has changed under my leadership, I mean it. There's a peculiar by-election on the horizon in Rochdale and questions to come about selecting candidates elsewhere. But the political risk Labour are battling to contain is that this episode could bubble over into a general election issue. Well, Henry is with me now. How much of a problem is this for the Labour leader and his party? There's real frustration at the top of the Labour Party tonight. Some of the messages on my phone from members of the Shadow Cabinet are not fit to be read out on air. There are issues of process and substance that they believe this has revealed. And bear in mind, it comes a week after a U-turn on Labour's flagship Green policy, which itself followed weeks and months of speculation about that policy. But politics can be a topsy-turvy world. I talked there about the Rochdale by-election coming at the end of the month. But at the end of this week, you have two by-elections where Labour are very optimistic about overturning two stonking Conservative majorities. And nationally, Labour still has a big lead in the opinion polls. But even in that context, there are suggestions in the Labour Party that this episode does reveal issues of substance, of process, that they need to sort out. Henry Zeffman, thank you. The Rochdale by-election will take place on the 29th of February. Here is the full list of candidates who are standing. Now, since the start of the conflict in Gaza, at least 339 health workers and paramedics have been killed while trying to save the lives of others. That's according to the Health Ministry, which is run by Hamas, designated a terrorist organisation by the UK government. The Israel Defence Forces told the BBC that any claim that they intentionally target Red Crescent or medical workers is baseless and untrue and that they act in accordance with international law. During the first six weeks of the war, a journalist who lives in Gaza, called Faras al-Adrami, started filming for BBC Arabic. He captured the lives of paramedics working for the Palestinian Red Crescent in the north of Gaza. One of them is Ala al-Halabi, who has worked as a paramedic for the last eight years. This is his account of life in Gaza. And just to warn you, there are very distressing scenes throughout this report. يكون عنده أشلاء وتحمله بين يديك تتذكر وانت حامل ابنه استهدفوا بار عمي أول امبارح 
استشهد عندهم عشرين شهيد فولسه ما زالوا في جزء منهم تحت الانقاض فالان تو يعني واحد من اولاد عمي طلعوه من تحت الانقاض على هذه الدنيا اه يا نصها يا اما كل هاي بتستفسحك هذه بنت مين؟ بنت محمد هذا محمد هذا محمود تمام؟ اه البنت هي شباب بسحبوا فيها قاعدين طبعا احنا بعد كل حال بنسجل الاسماء بنحاول ناخذ قدر المستطاع الاسم الحاله عمرها بحيث يكون عندنا توثيق هذا خاص فينا كهلال وخاص بالتعداد عدد عشان نعرف اخر الـ الـ اليوم او خلال 24 ساعه عدد الاصابات والشهداء الذين تم نقلهم كنا داخل هذا الاسعاف يا جماعه وتم استهداف المكان اللي احنا فيه يا الله 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 يا تم استهداف حار الشارع بحزام ناري بشكل كبير والحمد لله الحمد لله بخير 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 يا اكرم بخير The paramedics there in Gaza, and just so you know, the team in the ambulance there did survive. Allah now works in Rafa in the south of Gaza, and Mohammed has stayed in the north. You can watch BBC Arabic's film Gaza 101 Emergency Rescue on BBC iPlayer. It is there now. Well, our chief international correspondent, Lise Doucette, is with me. That was a, a very hard watch. Um, talks on a truce have continued today. What, what chance is there that these talks could be successful? Sophie, I'm sure all of our viewers are saying so hard to watch, even harder to imagine what it's like to live and work in Gaza now. And this, what we saw is one of the main reasons why the US, the UK and many others are pushing so hard for progress in these truce talks in Cairo, which would involve a truce as well as the release of the last hostages held in the Gaza Strip, about 130, in exchange for a certain number of Palestinian prisoners. The word from Cairo tonight is that the talks today made some progress. They're, they involve the US, the Egyptian, the American spy chiefs, as well as the Qatari prime minister. But the gaps between what Israel wants and what Hamas wants are wide. Hamas wants to see an end to the war. Israel's prime minister Netanyahu says the war won't end until what he calls total victory. And that's why his main priority seems to be not truce talks, but a military operation in the last town in Gaza where Israeli forces still haven't operated, Rafah, now home to 1.4 million Gazans, most of them displaced time and again over the last several months of war, living in tents, and that plan is ringing alarm bells around the world, including here in London. Many warning of a nightmare scenario with so many people there. It'll be much worse than we saw tonight. And that is giving even more urgency to these truth stocks. Liz Doucette, thank you. More than 100 women have been told that eggs and embryos they had frozen at a London hospital may have been damaged. Some of them had had eggs harvested because they were being treated for cancer. The fertility regulator, the Human Fertilisation and Embryology Authority, is investigating. Well, Graham Satchel is at Guy's Hospital for us this evening. What more can you tell us? Well, Sophie, this is absolutely devastating news for the 136 women involved, many of whom, as you say, were having treatment for cancer. They had frozen their eggs in the hope of having children at some point in the future because, of course, cancer treatment can lead to infertility. The timeline here is that these women had their eggs frozen at the end of 2022. 
Uh, then a few months later, at the beginning of 2023, the regulator issued a warning about the fluid that was used in the test tubes to freeze the egg, saying there was a problem with that fluid and the eggs may not survive the thawing process. Now, that warning was uh, a year ago now, and it's only in the last few weeks that the women here have been told anything about all of this. Guy's Hospital has apologised for that delay. They are saying that all the women affected have now been told. And the regulator is also saying that there is a possibility that this faulty fluid could have been distributed to other fertility clinics across the country. Although I should stress at this stage, they're saying that there's no indication that any other patients have been affected. The advice for women tonight who may be worried is to contact their clinic. Graham, thank you. The Body Shop, one of the biggest names on the British High Street for almost 50 years, has gone into administration, putting up to 2,000 jobs at risk. The company was founded in a shop in Brighton by Anita Roddick in 1976, making ethically produced cosmetics and skincare products. It was a trailblazer for so-called ethical consumerism. Our business correspondent Theo Leggett reports. It's a fallen giant of the British High Street. The Body Shop was once a favourite destination for teens and 20-somethings. It's now struggling to make money and the administrators have been called in. For 2,000 employees at 200 stores, it's a worrying time, with closures and redundancies looking likely. The Body Shop has potentially um, lost its way a little bit in the last 15 years or so and I think other brands have really started offering more. Um, the Body Shop just hasn't stepped up to compete with those and it's a really fiercely competitive market. The Body Shop was the brainchild of Anita Roddick and her husband Gordon. It made its name selling natural health and beauty products with a heady dash of social activism thrown in. It became a worldwide chain attracting attention from celebrities and even Princess Diana. But in 2006, the body shop was sold to the cosmetics giant L'Oreal. Some fans saw that as a sellout. Anita Roddick died a year later, and ever since, there have been claims the business has lost its magic. In its heyday, the body shop was immensely popular among young people, as famous for its social activism and sustainability policies as for its products like scented shampoos and body butters. But the problem is that over the years, it's lost some of that cachet. And competition has grown, which means young people can simply spend their money elsewhere. I remember it from my childhood and it is a bit nostalgic, but yeah, maybe it's not moved with the times. The eco message is more widespread and I don't think it's as strong here as it used to be. Because it used to be everything refillable pretty much years ago, so it doesn't feel like the same establishment at all. For the moment, the body shop stores are trading as normal, but experts say some closures and job losses are inevitable, as the once leading chain searches for a way to attract a new generation of young and savvy shoppers. Theo Leggett, BBC News. A man accused of murdering a police constable almost 20 years ago in Bradford has gone on trial after he was extradited from Pakistan last year. 38-year-old PC Sharon Beshenevsky was shot in 2005 during a robbery. The jury at Leeds Crown Court has been told that 75-year-old Piranditta Khan was responsible, which he denies. Danny Savage reports. PC Sharon Beshenevsky shot dead while on duty 18 years ago. She was killed during an armed robbery at a travel agent's in Bradford. She died on the pavement outside. When Sharon Beshinevsky arrived here back in November 2005, the robbery was still ongoing. Moments later, both she and her colleague were shot at close range. PC Beshinevsky died. Her colleague was seriously injured. Their attackers fled. Leeds Crown Court heard that seven men were involved in the robbery. Three at the scene, four others as lookouts or waiting nearby. Six were later arrested and convicted. The alleged seventh man went on trial today. Pirandita Khan was described as being pivotal in planning the robbery. The jury were told the defendant was responsible for organising this robbery in the knowledge that loaded firearms were to be carried. He'd previously used the travel agents as a customer. The prosecution say he was the only one amongst the group that knew the location of the business and the interior of the premises in question. The travel agents also handled money transfers. The defendant had previously used the business to send money to his brother in Pakistan. 
On the day of the robbery, he allegedly told his accomplices that there could be up to £100,000 in cash on the premises. Mr Khan was arrested in January 2020 in Pakistan. He flew there two months after the murder. He was extradited to the UK last year. Nearly two decades on, Piraditta Khan is now 75 years old. He denies murder and firearms offences. Danny Savage, BBC News, Leeds. Police in northern India have fired tear gas and water cannon to prevent thousands of protesting farmers from marching on Delhi. They're demanding higher minimum prices for their crops. The capital is ringed by razor wire, cement blocks and fencing on three sides to keep protesters out. The government fears a repeat of 2020 farmer protests when dozens died. Now, with crucial elections around the world in the next 12 months, there is plenty of concern about the way artificial intelligence and deep fakes could be abused and used to spread mistruths. In fact, it's already happened. Last year, an AI-generated fake audio clip of the London Mayor Sadiq Khan was shared hundreds of thousands of times online. The clip was so convincing that it inflamed protests in the real world. Our disinformation and social media correspondent, Mariana Spring, has tracked down the man who first posted the clip. She's here to tell us more, Mariana. Thank you, Sophie. I've been investigating this case of deep fake audio, and it's one of the first I've come across that's been linked to real world harm. It targeted the London mayor, Sadiq Khan, and was intended to sound like a secret recording, replicating his voice. The clip disparaged Remembrance Weekend and called for pro-Palestinian marches to take precedence. I control the Met Police. They will do as the Mayor of London tells them and obey orders. The timing explains why the clip went viral. Whether or not a pro-Palestinian march should take place on Saturday the 11th of November, Armistice Day, was a source of political tension. The march went ahead in a different part of London, but there were concerns the clip fanned tension at a counter-protest. We almost had serious disorder uh, that weekend, the, as, as it was, were you know, elements of the far right there, police officers were injured, arrests were made. It generated a lot of headlines at the time. I tracked down the person who posted this deep fake first, but the man behind this so-called news account refused a recorded interview. So this is an actor speaking his words based on my detailed notes from the conversation. I'm trying to report just real news. Well, except for the fake clip of Sadiq Khan. <laughs> well, yeah, but it's not all fake clips. It's not all fake clips. We post news that could be real with a sense of humour. There is currently no criminal law which covers this kind of scenario. The Malicious Communications Act doesn't cover electronic information that's false, but you would have to prove that the sender's purpose... It, sorry, it does cover, cover electronic information that's false, but you would have to prove um, that, that distress was caused on purpose to the recipient, which is pretty hard to do. And in this case, the Metropolitan Police said the clip does not constitute a criminal offence. Just imagine in a different scenario where there's more toxicity, or, for example, uh, in a close election, a close referenda, times where there's, you know, disharmony in a community, the impact a deepfake audio, an AI-generated audio or video could have. And that will be the worry, as Sophie says, of some politicians as elections unfold around the world, how AI technology can be easily manipulated to spread something you never even said. Thanks, Sophie. Mariana, thank you. And you can get more on that and the other cases of extraordinary hate that Mariana has been investigating in Radio 4's Why Do You Hate Me podcast. It's available on BBC Sounds, BBC iPlayer and the BBC website. Now, fly tipping can blight people's lives and it costs the authorities around £100 million a year to clear up this kind of stuff that's been dumped around the UK. But now police in Warwickshire have thanked a group of villagers for fighting back. Adam Beatty and his family took matters into their own hands when they saw two men dumping rubbish near the village of Meriden. Our Midlands correspondent Phil Mackey has the story. Even in the depths of a soggy winter, the view's spectacular. So this is the little lane that it happened and we regularly get vans and vehicles coming up. But as anyone who ventures into the countryside will tell you, there's a modern day scourge that's blighting the landscape. And then we came down to this corner and I could see it from here. There were two large and vast amounts and they're the pictures that have been shown. 
Last week, two men were caught dumping piles of debris out of two white vans along this lane. Adam, his brother, his son and a neighbour were able to block them in, call the police and then force the fly tippers to clean up their mess. The vehicles were confiscated. We made them clear the whole lot up, even going as far as to make them scrape all the paint up. We get fly tipping at least once a week of one sort or another, whether it be some individual bin bags or a transit van or transit pickup load or indeed lorry loads. There are well over a million reported cases in the UK every year. Will Dickinson's farm in Hertfordshire is a favourite for fly tippers. But like every landowner, he has to pay for the cleanup. As a victim of crime, we then are obliged under law to pay to rectify the crime. The government has to come down hard. At the moment, they're sort of pussyfooting around the edges. What's the answer? We need to see fines significantly increased in this country to a minimum of £5,000 for anyone caught fly tipping, plus six points on their licence. The problem, say campaigners, is the deterrent. Usually a small fine isn't enough, often less than it would be to pay to properly dispose of the waste. Wherever you get a quiet country lane like this that's not too far from a big town or city, then it becomes very easy. Too much of a temptation, really, for people just to bring their rubbish and dump it here like they've done with this fridge today. Absolutely disgusted, makes me livid. Uh, and what's the solution to all of this? Tougher measures on the perpetrators would be an absolute, really strong view of mine. Just come down on them really, really hard. No one wants the countryside locked up, but keeping fly tippers out is a constant worry. Yeah. Phil Mackey, BBC News, Warwickshire. Now, the impact of climate change is causing polar bears to be at risk of starvation during Arctic sea ice-free periods. A new study based on data from 20 polar bears shows they're being forced to find food on land and are struggling to cope with longer ice-free seasons. Researchers used collar-mounted cameras and GPS trackers to track the movements and actions of the bears. On average, they lost one kilogram per day because they had to eat birds' eggs, berries and grass instead of their usual diet of ringed seals. Football now and Manchester City continue their defence of the Champions League title, beating FC Copenhagen 3-1 in their first leg tie. The return leg will be played next month. Katie Gornall was watching. City are a better team with him in it. A winter break meant this was Copenhagen's first game in over two months. Bernardo Silva had their heads spinning. Now, this is the moment almost five years ago when the spire on Notre Dame Cathedral in Paris collapsed during that devastating fire. Since then, the cathedral has been obscured from view, covered in scaffolding as the restoration takes place. Now some of the spire is finally visible again, as Hugh Schofield reports. It's like the beginning of the end. For the first time in five years, the scaffolding on Notre Dame is not going up, but coming down, revealing for now just the very pinnacle of the new spire, surmounted by a cross and a statuette of a golden cock, just like the one that disappeared in the blaze. Et là, de le voir maintenant, voilà. So it's five years since I saw the fire. It was a terrible thing for France. When I open the window in the morning now, I can see the spire. It's beautiful and much better than before. The spire is made of oak beams, and for the craftsmen and women, the last task before the scaffolding comes down is cladding the wood in lead, the soft metal malleable enough to show the beauty of what lies beneath. After this phase, it's the rest of the roof that'll need to be covered with new safety mechanisms to cut the risk of another fire. When they said after the fire that they'd have the cathedral restored and operational again within five years, there was a great deal of scepticism. Well, it's now 2024 and fair's fair. Everything does seem on course for the planned opening in December. They're very aware here that the eyes, not just of France, but of the world, are on the cathedral. Its resurrection, a much-needed sign of hope. Hugh Schofield, BBC News, Paris. Time for a look at the weather now. Thomas Schavanaka, hello. Sophie, hello. And a very good evening to you. A soggy picture behind me. This pretty much sums up the forecast for the next uh, few days. Uh, plenty of cloud and rain on the way. But with that, it is going to be very mild. In fact, in some parts of southeastern Britain, temperatures could get up to 17 degrees Celsius. It's as a result of this mild airstream coming in from the south. 
west, but it's not the case everywhere. In fact, in Scotland, it's been exactly the opposite. Very cold, clear skies tonight. And in fact, early in the morning in the highlands, temperatures could be as low as minus eight degrees Celsius, whereas to the south of the weather front, uh, we've got temperatures uh, around double figures in the south of England, maybe seven for Liverpool. But here, of course, we've got these layers of uh, cloud, rain and drizzle, murk in places. And that's how the morning starts on Wednesday. But notice that that weather front now drifts into southern and central parts of Scotland. There'll be a bit of snow across the highlands. South of that, it's a real mix of a day. So thick cloud, perhaps glimmers of brightness from time to time. Spells of rain, possibly heavy, but where the sun does pop out could get up to about 14 or 15 degrees. And then this same pattern continues into Thursday, but the rain's basically in different places. So it's gonna be impossible to predict. The apps are really going to struggle. That's, I can tell you that for now. Um, temperatures, uh, 17 degrees possible, 16 or 17, uh, 11 degrees in Glasgow in that uh, mild southwesterly wind. And then, Towards the end of the week, we'll see probably something a little bit less mild. But for the time being, it's this airstream that's coming in. Look, this is the, the Canaries here. You've got the Azores there. Basically, this is subtropical Atlantic, and that air current is wafting in our direction. Really, really mild air. So here's that outlook then. Uh, temperatures possibly peaking at 16 or 17 degrees Celsius. Uh, the air mass will eventually change. So that means temperatures will ease to, well, still above the average for the time of the year. And you can see a lot of rain, rain icons on the outlook there. Back to you, Sophie. Thomas, thank you very much. And that is it from us. It's time now for the news where you are. Good night.